reality for me, for you, for, for all of us is every day, every hour, every minute, we are in desperate, desperate need of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's redemption, of God's healing in our life. That reality is the same for all of us. And the question that we have to ask, the question that is, that is faced to us is, do we acknowledge that reality? Are we aware of that? Often when, when things are going well, I'll, I'll speak for, at least for me, when things are going well, it's easy for me to, to push aside, to, to ignore that reality that I am a broken man in desperate need of God's grace and of God's healing. And often when we, we come off of weeks like we've seen in our city this last week, when we're faced with the news of a broken relationship, when we're faced with a, a doctor's report, whatever it may be, we come face to face with the reality of not only the brokenness in our own heart, but the brokenness in the world that we live in. And yesterday afternoon, I sat along with thousands of others at the sanctuary at New Life Church, and there was many of you there. There was many of you watching the service for Deputy Flick on the television. And we all came, whether or not those in attendance or those watching were followers of Jesus, every single one of us came face to face with the reality of the brokenness of this world. And let me just say before we move on how grateful I am, how grateful we are as a church for the men and the women who every single day put on the uniform, put on the badge, and serve us. I am incredibly grateful for them. In fact, last night, as you, you can imagine, it was, it was a long day, it was a hard day, an emotional day. Um, I came in here, you know, just with a few minutes to spare before the service started um, here for our evening service. But you know what? You know, every weekend, we have CSPD officers that, that serve us here, and I, as I'm walking in, I see an officer who had signed up for, for a shift here on Saturday night, and I'd seen him at the service. And he had come from the service to honor Deputy Flick and his family, and then he said, I have a job to do, and I'm going to go out and do it. And it doesn't matter that it's right afterwards, and he came here, and he served our community. We are grateful for those men and women who serve. But one of the things that stood out to me during that service, from everyone that spoke, everyone that I interacted with was, yes, of course, there was sadness, there was grief, there was anger, there was confusion, but there wasn't hate. There wasn't a desire for revenge. In fact, multiple times throughout that service, various speakers would stand up and say, yes, continue to pray for our family. We are hurting. We are broken. Continue to pray for us. But not only continue to pray for us, continue to pray for the other officers and their families who are injured, who are hurting, who are confused. Continue to pray for those officers. Continue to pray for the young man who is just trying to go home. And as a result of another person's decision, this young man may never walk again. Pray for that young man. And twice, twice in the service they said, Pray for that man's family who pulled the trigger. Extend forgiveness to that man and that man's family. They need our prayers too. What we saw yesterday afternoon during the service for Deputy Flick was something greater than revenge, was something greater than hate. It was the love and the peace of Jesus Christ that can only be explained through Christ Jesus. It can't be explained by us mustering it up on our strength, us just forming the words we think we should say, but it was the peace that passes 
all understanding. And here we are this morning, looking at our text, looking how God calls each of us to something greater, something that we don't conjure up on our own, something that is not from our own power, but from God's power, and how just as if, just like this, the family of Deputy Flick chose to live out something greater, each one of us has that choice before us today. And when that call from God comes, the question that we have to wrestle with this morning is how will we, we respond to that? We're going to see how Elisha responds in our text this morning. We're going to see how others have responded. But God is calling you and I to something greater, something not of ourselves. And the reality is, while it may not cost any of us our lives, it may. The reality will cost every single one of us something. We are to live our lives open-handed, recognizing that our lives do not belong to us, they belong to God. And I would encourage you today that when we respond to the call of something greater that God has in our lives, it's always worth it. It's always worth it. Before we dive into our text, let me say a word of prayer. Father, we are reminded on weekends like this, on weeks like this, of the brokenness of the world, of the brokenness in our own hearts. But God, we are also reminded of the redemption, of the peace, of the healing that only you can bring. So God, yes, we come before you admitting our brokenness, but God, we come before you grateful that you heal, that you restore. Continue to be with the Flick family as they heal the other officers that were involved in the shooting, the young man who is on the road to recovery. And God, yes, we even pray for the, the man's family who made that fateful decision. And God, I pray that you would use this to make your name famous, to make your name be lifted high. God, I pray for each person in this auditorium. We are all wrestling with something. And may your peace and may your joy be present. May we leave here differently. May we leave here looking more like you because you showed up and you changed our hearts. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 19 starting um, in verse 19 is where we're going to be um, for our time together this morning. If you were here over the New Year's Eve weekend, we looked at the first part of 1 Kings 19, where Elijah was coming from a spiritual high. He had just seen God moved in power. And then someone threatened his life. And right after seeing God move in power, instead of responding in faith, he fled in fear. And he ran away, and he went to another place where he was thinking God was going to show up in power. He went to Mount Sinai, and he hid there in the cave, and God did show up. And the wind, the earthquakes, and the fire. But he also showed up in the whisper. And Elijah wasn't destroyed by the earth, by the wind, by the, the earthquake, the wind, and the fire, because the rock, the cave, the cleft of the rock protected him. And God showed up in a whisper and said, Elijah, you're not alone. Your work isn't finished yet. You have more to do. There are others that trust in me that haven't yet started worshiping others. Elijah, go. Go and anoint these three men. Go and anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Jehu to be king over Israel. Elisha to be prophet in your place. Remember those three names because we're going to come back to those later on in our story. And we see Elijah going to anoint Elisha. And this is the, the beginning of the journey for Elisha to something greater. You see, by all accounts, Elisha had a good life. He had it made, but there was a call to something greater in his life. And we read in chapter 19, verse 19 through 21. So he, Elijah, departed from there found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. 
Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people. And they ate. And then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. On this journey to something greater that God is calling each one of us on, on this journey to something greater that Elisha is on, it starts in a very unexpected way. It starts with a party. This entire passage is rich and chock full of amazing truths. In just a hundred words, there is so much packed into this. I only wish I could communicate so much in a hundred words or less. And if you're honest, you're probably wishing that same thing too. <laughs> but God moves in the heart of Elisha. And when the call to something greater comes to us from God, we are to respond with joy. Let's see, Elisha is not just a mere farmer. And that's what makes this response so extraordinary. He was heir to a country estate. Twelve yoke of oxen in that day would have been a massive farm. In fact, one commentary suggests that one yoke of oxen is the modern day equivalent of one car. So the guy has 12 cars sitting in his driveway. And you'll notice that he was the 12th in line which means he has 11 servants in front of him. He has people that respond to his authority, even the place where he farms. We see earlier in 1 Kings 19 that his farm is called Abel Maholia, literally the dancing meadow. His farm was located in the breadbasket of Israel. It was prime land. It was the best farm, the most servants, and here comes Elijah. Elijah comes rolling in. Elisha is at work. Elisha has power, status, wealth, even comfort. He's at work. Elijah comes rolling by, takes off his coat of camel hair, throws it on Elisha, and I don't know if you caught it, he just keeps walking. Because okay? Elisha had to stop and run after him. Now remember, Elijah was a wanted man. He had been on the run for three years. He had just come from living in a cave. Can you imagine the stench of that jacket? It would have been dirty and coarse and gross. And he just comes, throws it on Elisha, and keeps going. Many of you, myself included, probably would have ran after Elijah, but it wouldn't have been to shake his hand. It would have been to say, what are you doing? But Elisha runs after him and says, can I go back to kiss my parents? And you see this interesting response where Elisha says, go back again. For what have I done to you? And Elisha is thinking, well, you, you threw your jacket on me, for starters, but Elijah's response when he says, go back again, for what have I done to you, is essentially, yeah, you can go back. But keep in mind, Elisha, it's not I who have called you. You weren't my choice. I didn't pick you. This is a call from God. Do as you please. But consider, this is a call from God to answer or to not the call of God in our lives is not something you make up. It's not something that others hand to you. It is something you receive from him. And when God calls, how do we respond? I think the temptation for me and for others is often is a, it's a response of, of sober reluctance. Oh, man, I know I should probably do this, but I don't want to do this. God's calling me to do it, so I probably should. We have this sober reluctance because we're afraid or we're fearful of the call of God. But Elisha 
gets this call from God, and he responds with an extravagant party. He burns everything, slaughters his oxen. He could have sold the equipment. We know just by the mere fact that he slaughtered the oxen, they belonged to him. He didn't have to ask permission. He could have sold them and you know, pocketed the money and said, well, I guess if I'm going to have this change of profession, this career change, I better build up my emergency fund because look at my new boss's jacket. It's old and dirty. It doesn't probably, this profit business doesn't pay well. But no, he threw a party. He threw a party for the people. Historically, in those days, they didn't eat meat. This literally would have been a once-in-a-lifetime event. People would have talked about this to their kids and to their grandkids. Elisha is being called to more than a mere change of profession. This call changes everything, leaving a life of comfort and power to become weak, giving up safety to become vulnerable, giving up wealth to become poor. He doesn't respond to the call of God with sober reluctance. That doesn't sound like something worth celebrating, does it? Giving up the power and the comfort that he worked so hard to obtain, to be a man on the run, but he does. He throws this party celebrating the fact he knows that the journey to something greater is not found in acquiring more stuff not found in obtaining more status or more power but being obedient to the call of God how do you react when God calls you to something with a somber reluctance or by throwing an extravagant party is God calling you to something now today this weekend, that you've been resisting, you've been pushing aside, you've been thinking, God, do you realize what this is going to cost me? Do you realize what I'm going to have to give up? I know it's probably for my good, it's probably for your glory, but the cost is extreme. And the upside down kingdom of God, when he calls us to something, we should respond with joy. Maybe you felt the call to open up your home to foster kids. And you know, you know how difficult and how heartbreaking that can be. And you don't quite know if your heart, your spouse's heart, your heart, your kids' hearts are ready for that. But you know that call is there. Respond with joy. Maybe the call you've been feeling God call, calling you to start serving, to give of your time. And you're sitting there thinking, I don't have any time to give. I'm already jam-packed in my schedule. How can I make this work? And you get a little just sweaty and queasy just thinking about giving up more time. And God says it's worth it. Maybe it's to seek forgiveness, to admit that you were wrong. You know God has called you to do that. But you don't want to. You're pushing ex against it. Maybe like, like Elisha, it's a call to live open-handed, with your finances, with your materials, with your stuff, with what you have. And I, I got to say, I am so grateful for the faithful and the sacrificial giving of this church. A year and a half ago, we said, hey, we at Rock Remen, yes, we have our normal general tithes and offerings we need to meet, but we also have 20,000 square feet of gutted and empty space below us and we want to do something with that we feel God calling us to do something with that and we feel God calling us to do something with that space without taking on any more debt any more loans and so church we need your help and since that first call went out a, about a year and a half ago you sacrificially given almost 1.5 million dollars in addition to keeping our budget strong, in addition to the offerings that have gone outside these walls, you have given sacrificially. Thank you for that. And we're going to keep asking for that. We have another 10,000 square feet that we want to finish, that we want to bring our little ones over from across the way to right below us to have a safe, a secure place for our kids, for parents, for moms and dads as they drop them off. 
You guys have responded so generously. In one month's time, March 10th, 11th, we're going to have a week of giving for that. I would ask, be praying if God, how God might be asking you to respond to that. And remember, for all of these, the call is from God. It's not from us. Maybe you say, man, I've answered that call. I don't have anything more to give. Thank you. Rest in that. Find joy in that. But remember, listen to the call from God and respond to what he is calling you to do because it is always worth it. It is always worth it. Even from our human perspective, our limited mind, it doesn't make any sense. The journey to something greater is always worth it. It's a call that God gives. It's unique to each one of us. It's a call that comes to you from God. But what isn't unique about it is that as we're on this journey to something greater, it will always, always be marked by complete surrender and humble service. Look again at the passage. We see Elisha literally making it impossible for him to turn back. He took his farm equipment. He took the plows, literally burning the plows, using that as fuel for a fire to grill his oxen on. There was no turning back. There was no plan B. He was all in with complete surrender to God and his life. No matter the cost, He's saying, no matter what it looks like, I'm in. I don't have another option. I don't have any more farm equipment. I don't have any more oxen. I can't go back. So God, as I answer this call, I'm yours. At Elisha's farm, he was in charge. He made the decisions. Other people came to him to receive instruction, and he literally burns it all. And we see in verse 21, he arose, went after Elijah, and assisted him. Elisha went from being the boss to being an unpaid intern. And this was not a short period of time. Elisha assisted Elijah for 18 to 20 years. He served him. He was, his, an atten he was the attendant. And often he served in menial ways. We learn in 2 Kings chapter 3 that after Elijah had departed, and been united with God. The king of Israel is asking for a prophet. He wants to inquire of the Lord. And he's saying, is there a prophet around? And the king's servant says, well, there's, there's Elisha. Do you remember uh, Elisha? He was here with that, that other guy, Elijah. And Elijah kind of had that weird death, non-death experience. You know, you remember that? And the king's like, yeah, yeah, I think I do. And they're like, Elisha was the guy that was washing Elijah's hands. He went from being the boss to literally doing menial tasks, washing hands, serving, going from the boss to an unpaid intern. As we strive for something greater in the kingdom of God, it will always be marked with that complete surrender. No turning back, saying, God, I am in, in humble service to others. Too often we want to skip ahead where we say, God, all right, I'm in. I surrender everything to you. Now, make me awesome. Give me a platform. Don't you see the gifts and the talents that I'm so willingly giving over to you? Here I am, God. Use me. Make me awesome. How easy would it have been for Elisha to say to Elijah, no, don't you understand? I was, I was in charge. I ran the largest farm in the area. People reported to me, I am capable of so much more than just washing your hands and getting your coffee in the morning. Elisha was called to do something, yes, but he was called to be something first. Here we see a principle that we see throughout Scripture. The greater the doing, the more the important the becoming the greater the doing, the more important the becoming. Are you trying to skip ahead? Saying, okay, God, I'm in. I want to respond to this call to something greater. 
but you're wanting to move past the becoming. You're wanting to move past the way that God wants to shape and form in you. And that's only found in what we heard from Pastor Kevin teach us last week out of Philippians chapter 2. Not, not equating quality, equality with God, something to be grasped, but taking on the very form and the very nature of a servant, wrapping the to- towel around your arm to serve others. There are things that God can only form and shape in you in humble service to others. If you don't thrive in the areas where God has called you to be a servant, in areas where God has called you to wash others' hands, to be unseen, if you don't respond and thrive in those areas, you will never thrive in the areas that God is calling you to do great things. Complete surrender, humble service, and the kingdom of God, that is the way to something greater. And as you wrestle with this, and as you think about this, this idea of complete surrender and serving others, the call for us is not for every single one of us to leave this place, burn our MacBooks, and then give everything away and start just washing people's hands that we meet on the street. But the call is to say, wherever God has placed you, wherever God has called you, you are fully committed completely surrender, no matter the cost. For some of you, that's going to be to stay exactly where you are, to be a banker, computer programmer, IT specialist, a stay-at-home parent. But you're saying, God, I'm all in. What I have for you is yours. Remember, remember those three names that we looked at earlier? Elisha was only one of three people that God told Elijah to anoint. Hazel, king of Syria, Jehu, king of Israel, and Elisha as a prophet. God doesn't just call people to ministry. He says any person who comes and gives me their talents and gives me their gifts, who surrenders to me to serve others, I will make you a unique instrument of my mercy, of my grace, of my justice in this world. There are certain people that only you can help Certain ways that you can testify to God's grace and mercy and justice in this world that only you can do. And you can't do it in a professional ministry context. The question is not are you called to professional ministry, but the question is are you totally surrendered to God no matter the ask, no matter the cost? Have you told God yes, no matter what? There's a story about a missionary that was preaching and um, at various churches. He was stateside for a bit, and he was going around to tell of churches that support him, an update on his work, and to call other people to the mission field. And as he ended his service, he made a call exactly to that, to the mission field. And he said, "If, if you feel God is calling you to be a missionary, come up front to the altar so I can pray with you. And during that that altar call, there was a little eight-year-old girl that got up out of her pew and walked down the center aisle to pray as her parents watched on with equal parts horror and pride. She knelt and prayed, made her way back to his seat, and her dad kind of patted her knee, squeezed her hand, and as they were walking out of the church, she said, well, sweetie, did God call you to be a missionary? He said, oh, oh no, Daddy, he, he didn't call me, but I wanted to go to the altar to put my yes on the table so that when he does call me, he already has my answer. And so the, it's your yes on the altar. God may not be calling you to anything right now. God may be calling you to something right now. Does he have your yes? Whatever it is, Whatever the cost, are you saying, yes, God, I'm all in, completely surrendered to you to serve others? God, you have my yes. It's yours. And we see this. Answering this call is hard. 
I get it. This answering this call to com be completely surrendered, to give up all that we have, to live open handedly, and not only to live open handedly, but to respond with joy, to respond with a party, to serve others, be completely surrendered. And you might be thinking, I can't do that. I can't do that on my own strength, on my own power. The good news is, you don't have to. On this journey to something greater, Yes, we are to respond to God's call in our life by throwing a party, by trusting in him that he is a good God, by living in complete surrender and humble service to others. But we see it's lived through the power of Christ. You can flip over 2 Kings chapter 2. We see Elisha is at the end of his unpaid internship. He's at the end of those 18 to 20 years of serving Elijah. And they come to this scene in the story, verse 8. And then Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. He took a hold of his clothes and tore them in two pieces, and he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him, struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the, and to the other, and Elisha went over. We live this call to something greater through the power of Christ. And we see that power on display here in 2 Kings. Elisha couldn't, didn't know what it was, but we do. You might be thinking as you read this passage, I don't see Christ in this passage. I see a cloak, I see a chariot, and I see this craziest non-death death ever. Look to the chariot. Think about what a chariot is. And in order to do that, I would suggest maybe think about what a chariot is not. A chariot is not something that you would take your husband, your wife, your significant other and say, I got a great idea. Let's go on this romantic char chariot ride through downtown. We can look at the lights. It's going to be beautiful. It's not what a chariot is is with all due respect to eric clapton and other musicians it is not sweet when it swings low <laughs> it is an instrument of war it is an instrument of destruction in fact often chariots were made of iron they were so heavy it wasn't uncommon for the horses that would pull the chariot to die in exhaustion because they exerted so much force just to carry the chariot. You got into a chariot for one reason and one reason only, and that was to kill somebody. Look at the clouds. It was filled with flashes of thunder and lightning. Elijah went up in a tornado. This was a terrifying experience. This is the glory and the justice and the judgment of God. In all of human history, when this scene had shown up before, there was destruction, there was death, it was lethal. God showed up in the burning bush to Moses and said, don't come any closer, it will kill you. God comes on Mount Sinai, descending on Mount Sinai to deliver the Ten Commandments. He says, don't touch the mountain, it will kill you because my glory, my justice, my judgment is descending. In 1 Kings 19 what we saw a few weeks ago. Elijah experienced this in the cave before the still small whisper. 
But Elijah had stayed protected in the cleft of the rock. He was safe from the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. He was protected by the rock. If he would have been exposed, he would have been dead. Nobody, nobody on their own power, on their own merit, can stand before a holy and just God. And here, we see there is no protection, but for the first time in human history, we see there is no destruction. When the glory of God comes down, it doesn't sink Elijah, but rather it lifts him up. When the glory and the judgment and the justice comes down, it doesn't separate him from God, but rather it unites him to God. The chariot comes right between them, but instead of to kill, the chariot comes to save and deliver. The clouds and the thunder do not consume, but they lift him up to unite him with his creator. This is a picture of the grace of God. This points us to the cross. Elijah was spared God's judgment even though he should not have been because years later, Jesus Christ is not spared even though he should have been. Instead, we see through the cross an instrument of destruction, an instrument that has one purpose and one purpose only, to torture and to kill. And 2,000 years later, we don't look to the cross as an instrument of torture, as an instrument of death. We look to the cross as an instrument of deliverance. It saves us. God has flipped the script. He saves us through the cross, defeating death. It is no longer a sign of punishment, but of grace. And instead of seeing Elijah ascend into heaven, we see Jesus Christ ascending into heaven, defeating death, now sitting at the right hand of his Father in heaven and saying, come to me, trust in me. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how great your sins are because of the cross, because of what I've done there, it is no longer a symbol of punishment of death, but a symbol of life and deliverance. Trust in me. You won't be crushed by my judgment and my justice. You will be united with me. Not because of what you have done, but because of what Christ has done on the cross. We see Elisha asking this kind of strange question, a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elisha is not asking to be twice as great as Elijah. See, in those days, the double portion of the inheritance is what you gave to the firstborn son. Elisha is asking, can I be your son? Will you be my father? And because of the cross, because we can see Jesus ascending into heaven, when we trust in him, he says, you are my sons. You are my daughters. You are united with me, not separated from me because of your sin. We are brought into his family. So as you live and think about this call to something greater, this journey to something greater, yes, it will cost you. Yes, we are to respond open-handed in complete surrender, serving others. But you don't have to leave this place pulling yourselves up by your own bootstraps, saying, I will do it on my own. We look to the power of Christ, the power that he has given to us as we trust him. And when we do that, the pressure's off. The pressure's off for you to perform, to try to make it on your own. Because we trust in the clouds that unite us with God, that lift us up and don't consume us. And we can do that for a watching world that desperately needs to know that there is hope, that there is something greater in this life that God has called each of us to respond to. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that, God, we don't have to do this on our own strength. God, I, we can't do this on our own strength. So, Father, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would strengthen each person in this room. God, you would breathe life 
into them. You would encourage their hearts. God, they would, have, they would have the courage to listen, the obedience to respond, and God, they would do so with joy. Whatever you are calling them to, God, we know there's a cost involved. But God, ultimately, it's worth it to be obedient because that's where life is found in you and in you alone. And God, we know as we're on this journey to something greater, God, there's going to be times where I know I will stumble, I will falter. God, I know the people in this room, their desire to love you, to serve you. God, I thank you that even when I am unfaithful, you are faithful. Even when I trip and stumble, you don't. You hold us, you protect us, and God, you are faithful to the end. So Father, hear our prayers now. And may we worship you with our lips, and may we worship you with our lives. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.